Thank you for joining us for today's educational webinar. You are listening in listen-only mode. We do have a Q&A box that you can ask questions, and there is a chat box should you need any logistical help. I will now turn it over to Dr. DeChico Bloom, who will moderate today's educational briefing. Oh, Dr. DeChico Bloom, I, I think you're still muted. So let's make sure we get- Hello you. there, good afternoon. There. Uh, welcome to today's educational webinar on non-human primates, neuroscience research, new techniques, new questions. My name is Dr. Emmanuel DeChico Bloom. I'm a professor of neuroscience and cell biology as well as pediatrics at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. I serve on the American Brain Coalition Board of Directors. Neuroethics is a hot topic among the ABC membership and we are partnering with ABC member, the International Neuroethics Society, to bring you a neuroethics educational webinar on non-human primates. We are thrilled to have uh, Hank Greeley, uh, founder and past president of International Neuroethics Society, speak with us today. Mr. Greeley is professor by courtesy of genetics, Stanford School of Medicine, Director, Center for Law and Biosciences, Director of Stanford Program in Neuroscience and Society, and Chair of the Steering Committee uh, of the Center for Bioethical, Biomedical Ethics. Mr. Greeley specializes in ethical, legal, and social implications of new biomedical technologies, particularly those related to neuroscience, genetics, and stem cell research. Mr. Greeley is also a member of the multi-council working group of the NIH's Brain Initiative, whose neuroethics working group he co-chairs. He co He's a member of the Committee on Science, Technology, and Law of the National Academies and chair of California's Human Stem Cell Research Advisory Committee. Today, Mr. Greeley will talk to us about the role of non-human primates within neuroethics. We will allow questions, we will allow for questions at the end of Mr. Greeley's talk, so please feel free to ask them in our question box at any time. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Hank Greeley. Thank you, Dr. DeChico Bloom. Um, I will say, I don't know whether this is just medical bias, but that great introduction and all those things you listed, the one that actually pays my salary, you did not. I am fundamentally a law professor at Stanford Law School and everything else um, follows. So I'm really happy to talk about this subject. It's part of a broader area of interest that I've been looking at for a while. There is a real dilemma with human brain research. The best way to study a human brain is to study a human brain in a human person. But human people are really bad lab animals. We lie, we cheat, we disregard instructions, we have lawyers, we have rights. You can't just, you know, if we used uh, Dr. DeChico Bloom as a uh, research subject, we can't just kill him, cut his brain up, look at thin slices anytime we want. Uh, there are limitations on us, but we are, we know, the best model for how a human brain actually works. And we've gotten around this in the past in part. One of the main things we've done is uh, use poor, unfortunate humans who've had a lesion or a tumor or a stroke or a genetic problem that compromises some part of their brain. Their, their suffering has uh, long been a major part of neuroscience. But we've also tried to use as research objects or subjects things that aren't people. Uh, we've used human neurons, human brain cells, usually in flat layers on dishes. We have used non-humans. We've used an awful lot of rats and mice. And those have told us lots of important things. They've been crucial to research in the human brain, but rats and mice aren't people. And thin, thin layers of neurons in the bottom of a plate aren't people. They tell us some important things at some levels of the incredible complexity that's the brain, I frankly think the brain is the most complicated physical entity we know of in the universe. Um, those help, 
but they don't help as much. So we've been looking for better models and new technologies are providing newer possible better models. One of them is neural organoids, which you may or may not have heard of. They're sometimes in the press referred to as mini brains, which is a terrible term for them. Uh, they're made by taking cells, usually from a patient's arm, and turning those, or a patient's skin, and turning those into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells, turning those cells into neural progenitor cells, and then putting them in a three-dimensional matrix. What you end up with is little balls of brain cells, about the size of a, of a large peppercorn or a small pea, that organize themselves, that differentiate and form different kinds of neurons, that form glial cells, that live for at least four or five years. These were only invented four or five years ago, so we don't know how long they can live, and that have neurons that fire. That's a really interesting model, and things that people are doing with those include taking cells from people with a brain disease, taking cells from people without a brain disease, and seeing if they can see anything in these organoids that's different in those circumstances. Another thing that people are doing is taking larger chunks of brain tissue, three-dimensional chunks, not just plated, flat, you know, flat plated neurons, and keeping them alive, viable, active, outside the brain. These will either be from autopsy, human brain autopsies, or uh, more commonly, uh, sort of leftover tissue from neurosurgery and studying those. The Allen Institute up in Seattle has been doing this. I think they're now up to being able to keep active and study chunks of um, neurosurgical tissue that are more than a cubic centimeter on a side. That's nice. The brain has roughly 1,300 cubic centimeters, so it's not perfect, but it's another way to try to understand what's happening in the human brain without actually risking harm to a human. There is another potential out there based on a study that was published uh, in Nature this past April. Nanad Sestan from Yale was able to take a pig's brain where the pig had been decapitated at a slaughterhouse. It was a pig raised for bacon and pork, decapitated at a slaughterhouse. The blood was drained out of it, out of its head. It was left without any blood for four hours. He hooked it up to a pump and pumped a perfusate through the brain and the brain cells revived. He didn't get an EEG, so he says the brain didn't revive, but the cells did. They were taking in oxygen, they were giving off CO2, they were using glucose. He took some out and patch clamped them and they were firing, uh, electrical firing. That's another potential model of taking a human brain outside a human, from a dead human, and using that to study. The ones I'm talking about today, though, are using non-human primates for this um, in a couple of ways. We've long used non-human primates in research. We've used them. Um, they've helped enormously in research leading to direct brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. They're helping in stem cell replacement treatments, uh, including uh, retinal degeneration uh, treatments. They're helping in gene therapy treatments. They're helping in neuroprosthetics. Non-human primates have been used for a long time. New technologies give us a couple more options with non-human primates to make them even closer to human. One is to take human tissue, either human brain forming cells, neuron forming cells, or these human organoids, human neural organoids, or other bits of human tissue and put them in the brains of non-human primates, creating what are called chimeras, animals that have partly a monkey brain and partly human brain. And then you can see how the human brain works, the human brain parts work in the context of a living organism, but a living organism that's not a human being with human rights and human lawyers. The other new possibility is to genetically modify the non-human primates to make them of, to make them closer to human models uh, either human models of disease or human healthy brain models. So for example, one could take a non-human primate, change through CRISPR or other gene editing methods, some of its DNA so that it has the genetic propensity to get early onset Alzheimer's disease through 
uh, what in humans would be a mutation in the presenilin 1 gene and then study and see, does it get Alzheimer's disease? How does it get it? How does that develop, et cetera? Another possibility is to take monkey versions of genes and edit them so that they become human versions of genes. So find genes that we think are particularly important in the brain, know the monkey sequence, the DNA sequence of the monkey version of the gene, edit it to make it the human version of the gene, and see what happens. These are new possibilities and all, everything I've been talking about is what I call human brain surrogates. Here's the dilemma. The closer we get to making a non-human research object that replicates a human brain, the closer we get to backing into the ethical issues that we have with research on humans. The more an organoid acts like, looks like, functions like a human brain, the more we have to ask ourselves, do we have to worry about its suffering? Does it have any rights? The more a non-human primate's brain resembles a human brain, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what have we actually made here? Is it something that we have to treat with more respect than we would normally treat a monkey? So I think this is a really interesting dilemma. On the one hand, we want something as close as possible to human in order to be able to study human brain better outside of a human, but the closer it gets to human, the more we have to worry about these ethical issues. So that's what I wanna talk about in the context of non-human primates today. I wanna to talk about our, how we would use these non-human primates, what the ethical and social issues are about such uses of non-human primates, and what we might do going forward. I have to say, I am speaking only for myself, I am the past president of the International Neuroethics Society, which I highly recommend. Uh, Google us on, on uh, the web. Uh, we're cheap to join and I think very worthwhile, but I'm not speaking for the INS. I'm also one author on a paper that's under submission that deals with some of these issues, but I'm not speaking for all the other authors on that paper. This is just my take on the subject, maybe shared by other people, but don't blame anybody else for what I'm about to say. All right. Non-human primates. Why would we want to use non-human primates? Because they're the closest organism on earth to humans. Um, sometimes people just say primates. Well, we are primates. Uh, the non-human primates make up something like 40 or 50 different families. The ones we're most familiar with are monkeys. On the other end, they're the great apes. We are part of the great ape group, along with gorillas, orangutans, uh, two varieties of chimps. They're the lesser apes, the gibbons. They're new world monkeys, they're old world monkeys. And then there are also a bunch of lesser known, uh, smaller uh, non-human primates that could be used. They are closest to us in their brain organization. They're closest to us in their genetic background. They're closest to us historically. Uh, we deviated from the old world monkeys. Our ancestors deviated from old world monkeys maybe 50 million years ago. We deviated from rats and mice maybe 100 million years ago. These things are much closer to us and they're also much closer in how they live and hence how they use their brains. Rodents typically are nocturnal animals whose main sensory organ is the sense of smell, um, to which they add their wonderful whiskers, which are much more effective as sensory organs than my whiskers are, uh, they're very different. Their olfactory bulbs of their brains are much bigger than ours. Humans and other non-human and non-human primates are primarily visual animals, and we have more similar lifestyles, and hence one expects more similar brains. Uh, and our brains, uh, depending on the size of the non-human primate, uh, the non-human primate brains are closer to ours in size. They're different in scale. Nobody has the kind of neocortex or cortex size that humans have, but monkeys have more than right, rats and mice. So we wanna use them because they are more similar to us. But that similarity also makes it harder to use them because they are, depending on the primate, uh, they're very social animals. They are very, uh, they react in ways that seem very human, that make us both 
sympathize with them, uh, empathize with them, but also worry about the way they may feel suffering and the kinds of suffering they may feel uh, in ways that aren't exclusive to them. We, we do worry about that with rats and mice, but we have a lot more good reason to worry about that with non-human primates. The use of non-human primates in these genetic contexts is likely not to encompass all the different families and species of non-human primates. Um, probably there are three that are likely to be most used, the three kinds of non-human, two of which are heavily used already in scientific research and neuroscience research. Uh, two kinds of old world monkeys, uh, of monkeys, the macaque and the, I can never pronounce this one right, the synologous monkey. And then of great and increasing interest right now is a much smaller primate, uh, the marmoset, a smaller uh, monkey that is easy to breed, relatively inexpensive, uh, and another candidate that's getting used widely uh, as a laboratory animal, particularly in Japan and parts of Asia right now. So I think when we talk about increased neuroscience use of genetically modified or chimeric non-human primates, we're probably talking about monkeys and probably just those three species of monkeys. We're almost certainly not talking about great apes. Uh, Research with chimpanzees has understandably been extremely controversial. And at this point, there's basically no invasive research going on with chimpanzees, as far as I know, anywhere. People are doing behavioral research to some extent, but they are an example of an, a species that is so like us that uh, the research ethics get very, very difficult. They're also extremely expensive. They're extremely strong. If a chimpanzee gets angry uh, with you, it can pull your arms and legs off without much trouble. Uh, chimps are not something we're gonna use. Similarly, gor gorillas, orangutans, et cetera, not gonna be research animals for this. And of all the other different species of monkeys and non-human primates out there, we're unlikely to use very many more because creating a good model organism takes a lot of time, effort, money, and work. You really need to understand a lot about it. So bringing in a new model organism is a huge investment. We've already made that investment for the synologous monkeys and the macaques. Um, and the investment is being made now uh, with respect to marmosets. So I think that's what we're likely to be talking about. The most interesting issues here are probably the genetically modified primates. That's already being done. Oh, well, I should say first, we have been using these primates for research for a long time because of their closeness to us. Um, and that's been controversial. It's also been highly examined. It's highly regulated. Uh, what would be different here is changing the primates' brains in a direct way, either by changing the genetic variations of genes that make up their brains or by adding human tissue to their brains. What new issues does that kind of use raise? Well, the biggest, the overwhelmingly most important ethical issue here is animal welfare. Um, we need to worry about causing suffering. We need to worry about causing suffering in mice and rats, and we do worry about it. Uh, we need to worry about causing suffering in a few invertebrates. Uh, there are some regulations in some places about research with octopi because they are sufficiently, at least in some species, intelligent, it's social that we worry about their welfare. If you're doing research with C. elegans, the almost microscopic little worm that's a subject of a great deal of research, we're not very worried about animal welfare there. Uh, with non-human primates, we have to be very worried about animal welfare. And what adds resonance to that in the context of genetically modified um, non-human primates is your whole goal is to create new phenotypes, new expressions of the genes, new to these, this monkey species. You're trying to make the monkey different in some ways. If it's only to give it a human disease, or if it's to give it a human gene that's, say, involved in 
oh, human speech to see if that changes anything about the monkey. You're, cre you're trying to create different monkeys. To the extent you're creating monkeys that have not been seen before, it can be very difficult to spot the presence or absence of evidence of suffering in those novel animals. So you've got all of the regular animal welfare issues. Coupled to that is what you're doing to the animals is making them effectively slightly different animals. So you have to be even more concerned about whether you're even noticing the kinds of evidence of suffering or other other bad things happening to these animals that you would see with more traditional non-human primates. There's a second big issue here that I'm not going to call an ethical issue. I don't think it's realistic enough to call it an ethical issue, but I will call it a social issue. And that's um, kind of a pop culture issue in a way. Scientists creating monkeys with brains that are more human. What does that sound like? Well, it kind of sounds like the planet of the apes and beyond the planet of the apes. There are public concerns about humanization. I'm not sure that anybody is truly concerned that these genetically modified primates are going to escape and take over the world, uh, but there is concern that we're making something that is closer to a human, closer to deserving human rights, closer to being able to assert itself closer to possibly being exploited by humans for other purposes. Now, and I think for the foreseeable future, those fears seem scientifically almost completely unjustified. I mean, we humans have 23,000 genes that make proteins. Uh, Non-human primates also have about 23,000. Almost all of the genes in a monkey are going to be in a human and vice versa just in slightly different variations. Some of them, the very, there won't be variations at all. For some genes, we will have exactly the same DNA sequence as non-human primates have. But in many of them, there'll be slightly different sequence. If you're changing one gene out of 23,000, you're not gonna get a chimp uh, or a monkey that talks or uses a submachine gun or otherwise fulfills the fears of Beyond the Planet of the Apes or the Island of Dr. Moreau or the long line of science fiction and horror stories. And yet, even though it's scientifically extraordinarily implausible, um, as close to impossible as I think one can get, I hate to use the word impossible with respect to any science, but I'm really tempted to use it here. In a sense, it doesn't matter how likely it is, if people fear that it's going to happen, that can affect whether the research can go forward. If people are worried about the planet of the apes, they're gonna be worried about their government funding this. And this is not an entirely uh, academic issue. In 2015, the National Institutes of Health announced a moratorium on certain kinds of human, non-human chimeras. They said they weren't going to fund any research that involved taking an embryo from a non-human vertebrate and putting human cells in it before roughly 10 to 12 days, before the, the, the event occurs in the embryo called gastrulation. This was based on sort of inchoate concerns, as far as I can tell, about humanization and would those embryos grow up to be in some way substantially human. NIH, to its credit, held a workshop at which Basically, everybody said, these are foolish fears. In October of 2016, NIH announced it was going to withdraw the moratorium in a few months. And then something happened in November of 2016. Uh, the presidential administrations changed in January of 2017, and that moratorium is still in place. There's no good scientific reason for it, but the, apparently somebody thinks there are good political reasons for it. So. These humanization fears, although I think at a, at a high level, although I think they are scientifically unjustified, could have some significant effect on the research. Which leads me to the last of the ethical and social issues uh, I want to discuss. And that is, why should we do this at all? Uh, why should we, given these concerns about genetically modified or chimeric non-human primates, why should we use them? 
And I think this is probably an audience where I don't have to stress this very much. It's because of the incredible amount and quality of human suffering that is caused by brain diseases whether they are neurodegenerative diseases, other neurological diseases, mental illness. It's estimated that roughly a billion people, so close to 15% of the world's population, has some sort of brain disease. Most you know, Over their lifetimes, probably a majority of people in the world will have some kind of brain disease. We all know, love, care about people who have some kind of brain disease. We may not know they do yet, but the older you get, the more friends, family, and others you find who have depression or have anxiety or have Parkinson's disease or have Alzheimer's disease. It's a source of enormous human suffering. Added to that, it has been a very, very frustrating couple of decades in translating brain research into good prevention and treatment. Um, I am tempted to say we've achieved almost nothing in the last 20 to 30 years. That's not quite fair. We certainly have, at basic research, learned a lot about how the brain works. Much of that is just learning how, you know, moving from one level of complication and complexity down to the next level and seeing that that's equally complicated and beginning to move down to the next level. But there have some, been some real um, important advances in knowledge. With the exception though of a few diseases, multiple sclerosis being one, there have been very few new treatments that really help. Uh, far fewer than in other areas. Cancer treatments have been exploding. Brain disease treatments have been stagnant. So much so that big pharma and biotech have been dropping their central nervous system research programs because they've been so unsuccessful. They've been losing money over and over without coming up with new drugs. So I have to put too fine a point on it, but I think it's almost a situation of desperation. When biology and basic science are advancing so quickly, when other areas of disease, not all, but many are advancing quickly, this huge source of human suffering, brain disease, has not been advancing. And there's almost a sense of, we need to try everything we can, which is one of the reasons that genetically modified or chimeric non-human primates become particularly important. It's not just that they offer a way forward that allows us to get closer to a human brain and a human body without it incurring all of the rights and concerns that come with human subjects research, but it's also they allow us some hope of making progress against devastating diseases and sources of human suffering, where so far we've been hitting, uh, hitting a wall. Now, last point, moving forward, um, what should we do about increased use of genetically modified or chimeric non-human primates? We need to be careful. We need to be very considerate about the welfare of the genetically modified and chimeric non-human primates. We need to be sure that we don't use more of them than we have to. Now, one of the great uh, uh, slogans in animal laboratory animal research is the three R's, one of which is reduce, reduce the number of animals used. Unfortunately, at least in the near term, this is likely to increase the number of non-human primates used because there are more uses for them. But we still need to minimize how many we're using, even if we're increasing the number. And that calls for useful things like collaboration and data sharing. Now, we don't need seven different centers around the world doing the same experiments with the same genetically modified monkeys. Uh, this makes collaboration and data sharing an ethical imperative in part because of the higher concern we've got about the welfare of non-human primates than we do about other areas where data sharing is still a great thing. It's good to do data sharing with C. elegans, with rats, with mice, etc. but it becomes more important with non-human primates. I think we also need to ask when should non-human primates, genetically modified or chimerically, when should they be used? 
and three possible scenarios where it might be used. One is where we have some good reason, some clear understanding to think this is the best way to address an important question. Uh, let's say you're interested, say, in the origins of language. You know, monkeys don't have language, but they're gonna be a lot closer to that than uh, rats and mice are. There are things that non-human primates, their emotions and reactions and phenotypes that they have in human or close to human form that you just can't study in rats and mice. Another one would be where we've got clear evidence that we've tried the other models and they have failed. An example of that may be Alzheimer's disease where pharmaceutical companies have literally lost scores of billions of dollars in the last 10 to 15 years on very expensive research projects and clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease. And there has been nothing to show for it even though we have had a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease for decades. The mouse model, we can cure it in mice. We're not sure it's exactly the same as human Alzheimer's disease, but whatever it is, we can cure it in mice, but that has only led pharma to lose billions of dollars in trying to take those same things and do them in humans. Maybe it's an area where non-human primates could be useful. And then there's, there's a, a third situation where Maybe we've had success in non-human, in other models, in, uh, in, in rodents. But there's some clear reasons to think that whatever we've done in rodents would need to be validated in non-human primates before we would be willing to try it in humans. Situations, say, where there's a critical period in brain development that exists in humans that doesn't exist in rodents or exists in very different times and ways in rodents. Or dosing, which could look very, very different in the big and complicated brain with its, with its vastly enlarged cortex and neocortex in humans than it does in rodents, and where non-human primate work might be essential before we're willing to move from rodents into humans. So we need to make sure that there's a good reason to use these. We need to try to minimize their use. We need to try to harmonize internationally the ethical, legal, and regulatory approaches to make sure these advances are applied responsibly. Um, we, from country to country, there may be variations in exactly how to go about it, uh, but we need to make sure that people who are using the non-human primates have the kind of specific expertise, both in non-human primates, but also in the transgenic techniques, so they can assess, care for, and treat these relevant species of non-human primates in effective ways. I don't think that requires new committees. Uh, I think it does require a commitment by all those using non-human primates, by those providing non-human primates, by those funding non-human primate research to make sure that the existing mechanisms, in the United States, they're called IACUCs, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees. Other countries have similar versions for them to make sure that they are knowledgeable about non-human primate use, to make sure that they are taking the non-human primate issues seriously, and to make sure that the non-human primates are being cared for in contexts where there are primatologists and others who are best equipped to understand what they need as a normal matter and to look for and assess any particular problems that are coming about because of the genetic modification or the chimeric nature of those particular non-human primates. There is no perfect answer to this. There will be suffering in non-human primates as a result of some of this research, not all of it, but some of it. There is suffering in rats and mice. The suffering in non-human primates, I and I think most people will take more seriously but I also take really seriously the suffering of the billion people and all of their friends and family who have brain diseases. There are inherent trade-offs. Um, this is, gives us new technologies. These new technologies of making human brain surrogates give us new opportunities. They also raise new challenges. I think we need to go forward with them, but we need to go forward with them very carefully both in terms of the suffering, potential suffering and the welfare of the animals concerned, and also the potential adverse reaction of the general public 
which could backfire and lead to real restrictions that hurt all kinds of research. So in conclusion, favorite two words for any audience from any speaker. Um, we are at a time of great possibilities, but we're also at a time of increasingly difficult questions. We, I do not have answers to those questions. I don't think we can have answers to all those questions until we start doing more of this research and modifying the answers as we go along. But it's really important to take the first steps of at least identifying what kinds of questions there are. I hope that this talk has done some of that, uh, but uh, I also hope that lots of other people around the world are thinking about these issues and trying to figure out how we can best deal with this dilemma of creating human brain surrogates in order to study the human brain better while treating those surrogates that are closer to human as a result of their treatment in a way that is ethically, socially, and politically appropriate. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Hank. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation. I'd like to uh, now open up the, um, the, meet, the meeting for questions from the audience. <clears throat> and so, um, while I'm waiting for some of those questions to come in, uh, I'm, I might just want to ask you, Hank, what, what kinds of results would you feel uh, justify the use of a non-human primate model? I mean, uh, as we talked about the progression from uh, rodents, for example, or even pig, piglets or dogs, yeah. at what point do you imagine this, uh, now we reach that threshold? So I think for one thing you'd be interested, you'd have to be interested in something that is a human disease and that we have some reason to think that humans are significantly different in their brains or in their phenotypes in the presentation of the disease than rodents or dogs or piglets. Um, there are an awful lot of, uh, you know, almost all of the mental illnesses uh, are going to fall into that category without really clear surrogates um, or, or disease models in other organisms. Uh, I think we'd want to be frustrated. We'd want to have tried other organisms and discovered that we didn't get good evidence from them. Um, usually there'll be things that are going to be relatively complicated and probably uh, involving behaviors that are going to be more uniquely human or more uniquely primate. So, um, you know, some things, they'll, they'll have to be, I think you'll need to make the case for non-human primate use, that there's something about the particular condition you're studying that needs a model organism that is closer to human than the other ones that we've tried. Um, and, and so I know that you've uh, already alluded to uh, an end-of-life disease, a neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, as a child neurologist, uh, I'm on the other side of the spectrum and look at neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. And uh, just to add some, some flesh to the bone here, uh, this last decade seen a tremendous amount of work in, in, in mice particularly with uh, uh, genes that have reached genome-wide significance as human contributory factors, whether they're synaptic genes uh, or uh, neurotransmitter regulatory systems. And sadly, uh, multiple efforts have been made to translate, for example, in fragile X mental retardation, yep. Rett syndrome, um, tuberous sclerosis, and although the, the trials were well conceived and principles were established within human cells, even in a dish, yeah. um, those 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 trials have uh, demonstrated that we can we cannot translate it this time from rodents uh, to, to yeah. human therapy. Right. Those are great examples. Biology is a bear. Biology is just really really complicated and. You get species different, and it may be that the non-human primates aren't close enough in some cases. I mean, there are areas of biology where closely related species just vary 
dramatically. Uh, cloning turned out to be really easy in mice and really hard in rats, really easy in cats and really hard in dogs. Yeah. So we hope that the closer you get genetically and historically to humans, the more useful this will be. Um, but there are no guarantees, and that's that's part of the dilemma here. The uh, autism is a nice example. I've actually seen some video of a macaque. I can't remember the exact uh, deletion, but it might have been Shank three or neuro or uh, neuro ligand three. Yeah, it's a it's a something a chromosome something Q twenty two. Oh yeah, well that would be Shank three. That's in the twenty two Q segment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where this macaque had that human delete the deletion that in humans is highly highly associated with severe autism yeah. now i don't know how to di diagnose autism in a macaque um but this uh, uh, the video shows a very unusual macaque one that's huddled in a corner that's not participating in any interactions with anybody else that frankly looks miserable um would you would we be able to see that in a mouse, would we have, we might see something, but I think that that's a nice example of both sides of it. You've got something that's exhibiting more of the behaviors characteristic of the human condition. You've also got something where it's hard not to, it, it's impossible, it was impossible for me not to feel terrible for that macaque, which seemed to be clearly living a bad existence. Uh, and yet, when I think about all of the humans living bad existences, I'm willing to trade some macaques off for it, but we need, but, but we can't do that rashly. Uh, that's, a, that's a costly trade off. It's one we need to, to think hard about and be very serious about. Certainly. And so, thinking from the physician scientist perspective and how we translate, um, you know, obviously, as we well know, most of the neuropsychiatric research support goes to rodents uh, for all the reasons that they're excellent tools. Yep. Um, but how, how does the scientific community and even different countries move to this next step if, if we believe that non-human primates should be, should be used? How does a researcher here at my institution, Rutgers, I mean, how do we engage a scientific community and what kind of infrastructure do we need here in the U.S. or, or for example, with our uh, other societies where I, I know that investment's being made? Yeah. So I think we do need some sort of um, global, uh, international structure, probably not uh, in any way governmental. Uh, but one of the researchers involved getting together, talking and reaching agreement on certain kinds of principles. That may sound pie in the sky in a lot of ways, and yet it works from time to time in science. One of the areas I work in is stem cell research. And almost every place in the world that does stem cell research follows a set of vo voluntary guidelines created by the National Academy of Sciences in 2005. They're useful guidelines, they're thoughtful guidelines, they're usually not required by law, but people follow them because they make sense. They're also been adopted by the International Society for Stem Cell Research, ISCR. I think something like that in this space would be good. Um, it can't be, it's not likely to be the same in every country. But I do think there's a nice choke point, uh, a nice control, a, a nice area for leverage in the primatologists, the people who raise and watch, who breed and watch and take care of these non-human primates. They're gonna have to be involved in all of this. Uh, they know each other uh, around the world. And that's a nice, I think, potential nucleus for a system of guidelines, suggestions, recommendations, dis ongoing discussions about how best to do this. It is going to be the case that there are going to be differences from country to country. Um, China uses a lot, has always and continues to use a lot more monkeys than we do. Uh, they seem 
less, um, I'm going to use the word sentimental. I'm not quite sure that's the right word, but less concerned than people in Western countries are about the non-human primates um, welfare. I don't, I don't want to say welfare grossly, but there's, there's just a different view of the non-human primates and that's likely to continue. And yet um, I think we can do things both in the United States, in the West, but also globally that everybody would agree on as minimum standards for appropriate treatment of these modified primates. Yes, and I, uh, you know, I know that there are seven primate centers here in the U.S., and yep. we certainly look towards them uh, to be uh, setting up these models and, and teaching us um, uh, next possible steps. Uh, I think one of the, you know, as a, as a bench scientist myself, um, there's a, you know, I guess what I'd call it an activation energy is that for me to actually get engaged with this, since I don't have the skills, uh, the training sensitivity to establish uh, models, they're probably, well, they might need to be an, a, at some level, a, a national investment, a, a process by which I could ask a question by collaborating with scientists who would then also perhaps provide those resources or, or brains, if that's what it comes down to, for us to analyze with our specialized techniques without me having to, you know, impossibly reinvent the wheel. I can't do primate work here. Right. So I do think one of the constraints on this will be primate work is expensive. It's expensive in dollar terms. Primates are a lot more expensive than, than mice and rats, both to obtain and to take care of. It's expensive in expertise that you have to come up with. Um, I have met in the course of my work, several of the directors of primate centers in the US and elsewhere. And I've been really impressed with their commitment to the welfare of the animals in their charge and their sense of the specialness of these animals. I think building ways for the primate centers to interact more closely with neuroscientists. Um, and it may be that, you know, it was one of the, one of the things that's, that's being discussed is, do we want to centralize some of this primate research? You could imagine having all of the genetically modified non-human primate research in the United States done in one or two of those seven primate centers. And the primates would be kept there, the work would be done there, but people from Rutgers or Stanford or Florida or University of Washington, wherever, would use those primate centers as collaborators, setting that up both as an organizational matter and finding funds for that is, something that is under some discussion. Um, another example of that, there's a lot of interest in the US in marmosets, but there hasn't been a lot of work done with marmosets. The interest is in part because they've got short generation times, they're relatively small, they're easier to deal with, they're less expensive. Um, if the United States is going to start doing significant marmoset research, there's gonna be some significant startup funding and education that's gonna be necessary before that becomes possible. I think the worst thing we can do is to rush into it and do a half-assed job of any of this. And uh, the, the, certainly the researchers who deal with primates and the primatologists running the primate centers are, uh, I have seen uh, acutely uh, aware of that and concerned about it. And, and so, one additional, because this is an area I, I don't know about, is is the pharmaceutical industry playing a role, participating, waiting for others? And, and of course, it's not, I mean, you know, that, that's a big word, and there are many different companies with different goals and needs, but is that part of the equation, or are they waiting to that others step up, or is it just too complicated for them to be involved? So my best answer to that is I'm not sure, uh, because I'm not sure. Uh, it is my impression that pharma is not doing a lot of non-human primate research, uh, in part because they're pulling back from a lot of central nervous system research, period. 
and in part because non-human primate research comes with extra financial costs and potentially extra public relations costs. Yeah. And one thing we have not mentioned is the strong, um, a strong movement against any research with non-human primates and against animal research in general, but specifically against uh, research with non-human primates, including at its extremes, a terrorist fringe that has tried to attack researchers who've done animal research and non-human primate research as well as facilities. So I, I think pharma is not eager to get into this, but that is, that's an impression. It's not, uh, I don't have good firsthand knowledge to answer your question. Yeah, and I, I do wonder that if this was done as so much research in, initiates in the academy and, uh, and w whether academia with support of NIH or other uh, major support mechanisms, if they set up a system, one could imagine that a moment in time pharma would say, here's an opportunity, here's a, for you know, my universe, here's a, a good convincing uh, reproducible synaptic model for autism, whether, you know, whichever one of my molecules I want, and there, right. are, there are a number. They may then said, I want to start to target that with our drug library, which we have, and we've created it in mice. It wasn't useful for, for people, but now that we have a genetic model in-house that is validated by those who know how to do it, this is, a, a, this is now a universal resource that could not have been developed in pharma. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think that's a great example of one of the things I mentioned more obliquely uh, in my talk. The idea of collaboration, data sharing, and so on. It, I don't know that it would make sense for pharma to build, a, for any pharma company to build a marmoset colony or build a macaque colony, but to be able to do research when it's appropriate and necessary in a centralized facility or a set of different facilities that provide the appropriate level of care and attention and have the right level of expertise, where Smith Klein, where uh, GSK could go to a primate center and say, you know, uh, uh, this guy at Rutgers, he's come up with this nice marmoset model for autism. We'd like you to test uh, these following compounds on marmosets that have that genetic uh, variation. Uh, I think that would be a good thing both for medicine, but also in terms of making the best use of the non-human primate um, resource. To make, making the best use of non-human primates, not using more of them than we need to and making sure that when we use them, we use them well. Well, I, I think that's a good plan for the future, Hank. I want to I thank you. I've, it's been a very informative and productive uh, conversation we've had today. Uh, so thank you very much uh, as a representative of the International Neuroethics Society, which we'd like to thank for co-hosting today's uh, webinar. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you who are participating. Uh, the ABC Program Committee welcomes your input as we brainstorm future ABC educational webinars. Please contact the ABC staff uh, with any ideas you have. And just to remind you all, this, uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available online for viewing whenever you wish. I'd like to thank you all for your participation and have a nice day. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Hank. Bye now.